the second thing that we then moved into as a group occurred in 2008 when we were at the International AIDS Conference in Mexico City and a, a fascinating group, a fascinating little NGO called the Girl Child Network in Zimbabwe came to us and begged us to intervene because in the elections in Zimbabwe in 2008, one of which was held in March, one of which was held in June, between the elections, Mugabe had unleashed his youth corps and his war veterans to rape women solely and exclusively because they supported the opposition party. There was no other rationale. And the raping was extensive and terrifying. And they said to us, we know you'll take it on. We, we, we don't want to do this in a casual way with one news story or one press conference. We want to do it more seriously. Can you suggest what we should do? And, and we got together and agreed that in this instance, we would actually go in and take affidavits. We would find the women who had been raped and take affidavits and assemble a dossier which we felt would undoubtedly amount to crimes against humanity, and then see if we could get some of Mugabe's thugs and colleagues before the courts in South Africa because they're constantly coming into South Africa. And, and I'll explain that in a moment. There is a vehicle through which you can prosecute in another country. Well, just as we prosecute Rwandan war criminals because we have something called universal jurisdiction, which means that we have domesticated the international criminal court statute. We have brought it into Canada and make it, made it applicable here if we choose to pursue the legislation. So South Africa is the one country in Africa that has done that. So we got two very distinguished law firms, one Canadian and one American, and we made six separate trips to Africa, to Botswana and South Africa. We secreted the women out of Zimbabwe, and we took the affidavits of over 70 women. We could have taken many more, but we had a panorama of representative uh, uh, sexual violence across the country, and the patterns were absolutely repetitive everywhere. Gangs of young thugs raising clubs would gather outside a home, they'd chant, they'd cheer, they'd sing, they'd break into the home, they would either kill or beat the uh, partner, they would rape the, uh, the woman in the presence of her children, they would rape some of the young girls, they would take the women to literally a rape camp and keep her there for two or three weeks, uh, applying gang rapes on a continuing basis. They screamed abuse at the women. They said things like, tell this to Tony Blair, tell this to George Bush. They, they actually were that specific. And in every single instance, the women were organizers for the opposition party, or married to organizers or candidates for the opposition party, or activists in the opposition party. It was all opposition related. And we felt we, we had indeed compiled a dossier uh, that we could pursue under crimes against humanity. The women were destroyed. The raping was so foul and so brutal and so savage, politically orchestrated rape, that it is beyond the telling. And we were absolutely determined to do something because the women would say to us, we want justice, that's all we have left. We want justice. It's very hard to get justice in the slow-moving apparatus of the courts particularly when you have a country like South Africa, which for the longest time, indeed even today, is resistant to moving in on Mugabe because of the crazy relationships that exist amongst some of the countries, although there's more and more impatience with Mugabe and his behavior in Zimbabwe and the way in which he has destroyed the country. But we decided to pursue this in a very serious manner so we took our dossier before the leading lawyer dealing with what is called the National Prosecuting Authority in South Africa, the NPA, which, to which such submissions are made. 
and we took it to the lawyer and he said, you've got an unassailable case, by all means pursue it, but the National Prosecuting Authority wouldn't hear it and we decided we shouldn't take it. This was back in 2009 because another case against Mugabe involving torture had been brought before the National Prosecuting Authority in South Africa and they had refused to hear it and it was under appeal and it was taking forever because there was government intervention and there was police obstruction and the National Prosecuting Authority internally was, was divided. But you hang in because you've got to get justice for those women. I, I just can't describe the women to you. The affidavit sometimes took seven or eight hours. We put it all together in a report. If you go to the website of, uh, of uh, aidsfreeworld.org, you'll find it. We, we called it uh, um, sexual terror in, uh, in Mugabe, Zimbabwe. And, and I, I, I think that what happened to the women was almost indescribable. And so we decided we would never give up. And I want to tell you, it's just so interesting that, that this week, this week, the High Court of Johannesburg, uh, to whom the appeal had been made, rendered a decision on the torture case against the National Prosecuting Authority. It's a hundred page decision, a most extraordinarily unequivocal decision, saying that the police the government of South Africa, the National Prosecuting Authority themselves, had failed to execute the legislation that existed. We know that'll be appealed again to the Supreme Court in South Africa and after that to the Constitutional Court in South Africa. But now that we have a case which the National Prosecuting Authority has lost, we will very quickly and urgently submit our own case on rape in Zimbabwe. We know now we're part of the mix. We will submit an amicus brief to the higher levels when the torture case proceeds. It, 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 it just feels that, by God, we're not going to let some of them off the hook. That when they venture, these, these, these corroborators and, and predators and rapists, whose names we know, when they venture into South Africa, it will be possible to bring them before a court of law. It'll take another year or two, but it just doesn't matter. We're going to give those women a sense of justice. And then after Zimbabwe, we got pulled into the Congo, which is without question the worst place in the world for women, where since 1994, after the Rwandan genocide, multiple militias have wandered through the Congo, creating havoc and engaging in patterns of sexual violence, which are absolutely a nightmare. There was one report at one point just last year of a thousand women being raped every day in the eastern region of the Congo, in what is called the Kivus. And I've, 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 I've visited the eastern region and spent time in the Congo. And in the eastern region, in the south Kivu part of the region, there is a, a little capital called Bukavu. And in Bukavu, there is a little hospital called the Pansy Hospital, headed by an astonishingly gifted and principled surgeon whose name is Denis Mukwege. And he and his colleague surgeons, few in number, spend a good part of their time surgically repairing the reproductive tracts of the women. And it is, uh, it's just terrifying to think that this is a pattern. And although the International Criminal Court, as you may have read, finally found guilty a leader of one of the worst militias, a leader called Labanga, he was found guilty and had been indicted of crimes against humanity around child soldiers. They found it difficult to prove the rapist because women will not come forward when they have been raped. So then we went to Kenya and to Liberia to begin to try to understand why wouldn't women come forward so that you can prosecute the rapists and begin to overcome the culture of impunity. And in Kenya, which had a terrible outbreak of sexual violence after their elections in 2007, 2008, we met with 20 or 30 women's groups, all of whom said, 
We, we'd, we'd like to start a process of getting the rapists before the courts so you could change the culture of impunity. You could give women some sense of, of, of justice that, that we could break this pattern of congenital endemic raping, whether you've got conflict or pre-conflict or post-conflict or politically orchestrated or generally within the society. And there we started talking to them about safe houses about women coming forward and witnesses coming forward and having safe houses which would allow the prosecution to proceed. And then we went to Liberia where we had the first ever woman president, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, who shortly after she was president created a rape court, the first in Africa, because the raping, you just read about the indictment of George Taylor, who will be uh, sentenced later this month, the raping that occurred during the civil wars in Liberia and Sierra Leone were, were just ghastly. And Ellen Johnson Sirleaf wanted to send a message, so she set up a separate court. By the way, Canadians were involved in drafting the, the legislation. And, uh, and not many women are coming forward to the court. And it's particularly appalling in Liberia because after the civil conflict was over, the raping continued but it was focused on young girls between the ages of 8 and 12. I, I, uh, I, I visited with Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. We had together served for two years on a panel investigating the genocide in Rwanda, so we were friends. And, and, I, and I said to her as president, Ellen, uh, uh, what are you going to do about this? And she said, Stephen, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm gathering together some of the best frontline women in the world on International Women's Day, and we're going to try to find out how to handle it. And gradually there emerged for us from our work in Zimbabwe, in the Congo, in Kenya, in Liberia, there emerged for us the need to answer the question, why don't the women report the rapes? And we put it under the rubric of know your epidemic of rape. And Paula, again, who, who has a particular skill in these areas, drafted a fascinating kind of prospectus, which we're using to raise some money. Because you see, it's, so, it's, it's both fascinating and unnerving to recognize the reasons in Liberia the reason women weren't coming forward, or the reasons women weren't coming forward, were primarily, A, because the police didn't have petrol for their motor scooters to go into the villages to collect the evidence, or B, the women didn't want to come into Monrovia in case the trial lasted two days. Where would they sleep overnight? They certainly had no money for however downtrodden the hotel, or C, what if you had a trial during harvest period and the women are doing the harvest, how could they possibly go to a trial when they needed the food both for their families and for sale? Uh, so, and when we were in Kenya, it all had to do with the doctors who were not prepared to do an examination, or the police who would not give the woman the form she had to fill out in order to claim sexual violence. So everywhere you look, there were cascading series of reasons which, were they to be confronted and overcome, might, I'm not being uh, definitive about it, might open the door to actual trials, actual convictions, and begin to reduce the culture of impunity. So under that broad heading of, um, of uh, ending the epidemic or knowing your epidemic of rape, we're in the process of setting in place a research apparatus for six or eight sites in countries ranging from politically orchestrated rape to the rape that occurs around extractive industries, around mining sites, and see if we can find a way of breaking that monolith of obstruction that prevents women from getting justice. I have to say, and I have been influenced so hugely by Michelle in this that I, you know, I can't say it strongly enough, that I, I, I believe that the single most important struggle on the planet is the struggle for gender equality. 
Nothing comes close to it. And to watch the absence of gender equality, to watch, to watch the absence of gender equality destroying women's lives is, is the most heartbreaking and unconscionable and insufferable reality I've witnessed. And then the third thing that, uh, that we then got involved in was that something called the Mac AIDS Foundation came to us. Uh, you may know Mac AIDS, they sell the, the lipstick Viva Glam, uh, which I hope all of you who uh, apply lipstick uh, will hereafter purchase. Uh, every penny that Viva Glam raises goes to work on HIV and AIDS. And uh, now that Lady Gaga has announced that she's using Viva Glam, uh, suddenly what began when we started with Mac AIDS, uh, with a 12 to 13 million dollar a year proposition, has become a 60 million dollar a year proposition, I assume all purchased by Lady Gaga herself. And I, <laughs> I, I, I think that, uh, that it's important to know that there are these idiosyncratic outfits out there that do wonderful work. And Mac Aids came to us and said, AIDS free world, we know you're small, but you seem to be, uh, you seem to be approachable and determined. Would you do something about homophobia in the Caribbean? And we said the exact connection, and they made, of course, the exact connection. They said the incredible homophobia in the Caribbean drives men who have sex with men underground. Uh, they don't get tested or treated. There's no prevention. Sex is furtive and anxious. And then you look at the rates of infection, and they're very high. In Jamaica, the rate of infection on HIV of the general population is 1.6%. In the gay population, in the gay male population, it's 32%. So obviously, something has to be done to overcome the intense anti-homosexuality of the uh, of the society. So we decided to work on Jamaica first because frankly, I'll uh, be quite frank with you, I've never seen such a homophobic society. I went to Jamaica and did a number of open line radio programs and I felt I was leaving with my life intact or barely, <laughs> barely intact because it was so uh, brutal uh, of attitudes. And, uh, and we decided on a two-pronged strategy in our advocacy. One prong would be to deal with the culture the prevailing social and cultural attitudes. And the second prong would be legal. And that would constitute an advocacy package. So we started softening up the culture. We started doing public service announcements, letters to the editor, uh, debates with the fundamentalist right wing, demonstrations outside appropriate buildings, handing out of material, getting people to realize that we were fighting for tolerance in a society where a recent survey had, had shown that 86% of the population self-identified as homophobic. So that's a fairly high mountain to climb. Uh, and, and, and we were determined and we kept at it and we hired uh, a remarkably talented uh, gay lawyer in Jamaica named Maurice Tomlinson who has now established an international reputation and has been working now not only in Jamaica but they're doing training on documentation and bringing evidence together in St. Lucia and in Trinidad and Tobago and, and we're supporting a cross-dressing case in Belize and doing some work in Guyana. I mean, it's really fascinating, but Jamaica was the target. And then we did something that gives me great pleasure. We launched the first ever, this is just a few months ago, we launched the first ever case against the Jamaican anti-homosexuality law before the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. And if in fact it is heard as seems to be the case, we've had it accepted and the dossier is there and, and it's in the docket and they're ready to proceed, uh, when it's heard, I think we will win, and I think that will have significant reverberations throughout the Caribbean, let alone overturning the legislation in Jamaica. But then something happened which sort of took my breath away. Uh, uh, there was an election in Jamaica in December, and the party in power and the prime minister had been extremely homophobic. In fact, the prime minister, in an interview on the British uh, program Hard Talk, had said that under no circumstances would he ever have a gay man in his cabinet, ever, publicly, unequivocally. 
so it was, it was uh, difficult under those circumstances. But the woman who headed the official opposition at the time said publicly that she would allow a free vote on the sodomy laws, as they're called, in Jamaica. And the last 10 days of the campaign was consumed by a discussion of homosexuality. It was most extraordinary that a country's electoral process would deal with an LGBT issue of that import.